should be an interesting topic if obviously you're here because you're interested in how you get a great pollinator planting going. So as Pete said, I've been a wildlife biologist. That's been my entire career. Grew up in New Mexico and ended up in Missouri, one of the one of the best states, I think, for conservation um, as far as conservation agencies. And I was lucky enough to work as a private lands biologist and an upland coordinator for the state for many years before I went to uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, at which point I met Pete. And he sparked my interest in pollinators. So I had a lot of interest in quail to start with got very interested in pollinators because of the habitat that they share with the other upland uh, upland birds. So it's just uh, been a passion of mine really since I started working as a private lands biologist. And I've been able to, lucky enough to be able to continue that throughout my career. And I will tell you that these past um, six years with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund have been some of the best of my career. Uh, the people that we meet and the people that are doing work for pollinators are just bar none some of the best people out there, really interested in doing the right things for pollinators. So this is the kind of thing that you'd like to see, right? As your pollinator planting, um, Pete always says it's when you open your calendar to the month of July and that's the centerfold in your calendar. Um, you know you're a person that's interested in pollinators when this is what it looks like. And that is what we want out of a habitat project uh, for pollinators. We want diversity, we want color, we want beautiful blooming wildflowers. Um, how do we get there? There's another beautiful blooming wildflower project that we're working on with a landowner in, in Minnesota that I'll show you some pictures of how he started and, and where he is at now with his planting. Um, but how do we get there? I will argue with you that there are five things that a very successful project have in common. One being a well-designed seed mixture. The second being a thorough site preparation, seeding it correctly, either broadcast drilling, hydro seeding, great first year maintenance. There's a lot of mowing involved in the first year establishment of one of these pollinator plots to combat the weeds that do come up. And then a follow up on invasives. Those things are all critical, but probably the most important one on this list is thorough site prep. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We're not really gonna talk about the other pieces tonight. That'll be another webinar, but thorough site prep is probably 95% of the success of your project. When you come back to us in five or six years and say that project didn't turn out quite the way I thought it would, I'm disappointed in the results. Nine times out of 10, we can look with you, go back over the information and say, man, that site prep just wasn't done quite correctly. Um, so that is the key. It, it really is critical to your success and, and how well you get the site prepared. So these are some questions that you want to ask yourself before you start your project. What's the existing vegetation? Is the site in grass? If the site's in grass, that instead of doing uh, a 3 out of a 10 in site prep, you're going to need to do a 10 out of a 10 in site prep. Uh, you really have a lot more work on your plate if your site is in existing grass. Are there any invasives? That obviously slows the project down. You need to really make sure that those things are not seeding out on your site. Do you have the equipment and the time to apply the management? Uh, if you call me up today, you know, the middle of April and say, I wanna plant a pollinator planting next month and you're in existing grass or you have a old field with grass and weeds in it, you're, there's no way you're gonna be ready to do any type of spring planting. You're, you'd be lucky if you'll be ready next winter to do a dormant season planting. There's time that it takes to get this site prep done correctly. Can you or will you use prescribed fire to help prep the site? That is one of the best tools that we as wildlife managers have at our disposal, but some folks can't use it or aren't comfortable using it. But I will tell you that if you can get comfortable with prescribed fire, it's probably one of your best tools and definitely the cheapest tool. Uh, to be able to set back vegetation, to get things ready for spraying, to get things ready for seeding. Uh, prescribed fire has a lot of really good management uh, potential uh, for managing later on as well. And then this is a big question for a lot of people that do contact us. Am I okay with the use of herbicides to shorten this process? Am I okay waiting four years for site prep using a method that doesn't use herbicides? Or do I want that seed in the ground and growing in a year 
and I'm willing to use herbicides to get there faster. Um, and that's a personal preference question, and you have to answer that because it's your site and it's based on the way you want to manage that site. So the first thing you do is assess that site and define your goals. Where do you want to plant the planting? Um, what does it look like now? What are, what are our challenges moving forward with this site? We've identified invasive species or that we have a heavy brome infestation or fescue. Um, remove the existing vegetation, all the weeds and all the grasses. And by remove, I mean terminate, not disc under once or disc under twice. That does not remove the existing vegetation. I'll argue even more that any type of tillage will just throw another layer of fresh seed on the ground that was buried a little bit and now it will be exposed to the elements and now it will start to germinate. So tillage, um, unless you're using the natural method of site regen and or site prep and you do multiple tillage passages for multiple years in order to stimulate the seed bank and then till it in, um, tillage is not a preferred method as one of our methods for, for getting the site prepared the best way you can for pollinators. And then the last piece is that you have to prepare that adequate seed bed. It's not enough to just kill the existing vegetation and leave it laying there. You have to make sure that you have good seed to soil contact. And again, you could use, uh, you know, if you used herbicide, you could use prescribed fire to then take off that excess litter and vegetation that will prevent your seed from making it to the soil surface, which is what we want when we do a broadcast seeding in the fall, which is our preferred method of getting a high quality project started is a fall planting um, broadcast into um, a prepared seed bed. So we've broken this down for you into four different site prep options. Uh, and you're gonna see this slide, we've got it available in our, um, it's, it's becoming available in our literature. Right now, we're just using it for this webinar, but we'll have it available for folks to look at. We do have, we do use these same plans in our habitat um, guide. So you can see the plans in our habitat guide, but we're starting with you from green, from left to right. It's the longest site prep timeline to the shortest site prep timeline. And difficulty levels from more difficult to least difficult. Uh, all but the natural method plan use herbicide. And you can broadcast or no-till drill most of them. As you move forward, I'll show you this slide again so you can get another look at it. But we're gonna start um, talking about herbicides here. When you use herbicide, so the three plans that you will be using herbicide to go ahead and get your site prepared, you have to check for residual before you use an herbicide. A residual is when that herbicide is effective longer than just the day it's sprayed or it affects longer term on the site. So some have residuals up to 36 months and that residual of that herbicide is doing its job when it prevents your pollinator planting from germinating. So that's what it's supposed to do. So it's your job, do your due diligence in herbicide residuals. Um, here's a page from our pollinator habitat guide. It's on page 14. There's a link to the habitat guide uh, in the chat. We're gonna practice our first in the chat link for you. Um, it's in there. So page 14 of the pollinator habitat guide, we'll talk a little bit about residuals. And if you see the bottom QR code here, it's gonna tell you how many months you need to wait before planting your pollinator habitat after an herbicide application. And that's all based on what herbicide you're using. So for example, if you're using atrazine for corn, um, you've got two, 24 months or two years before you can have a successful pollinator planting on that site. Um, glyphosate, on the other hand, Roundup, has no residual. You can spray it. It only affects green and growing vegetation. You could spray it and plant the next day and it would not affect that planting negatively. And so those are the things you look at on some of these, like, uh, the, some of these plans that we've talked about. The herbicide residual is really important. It's important if you've just bought a property to know what that herbicide or what herbicides were used on the site um, so that you can plan when you want to do your site prep and when you want to go ahead and plant. So we're going to go through these one by one. We're going to start with the gold plan. And our gold plan, many of you have read our materials and you already know that our gold plan involves the planting of 
soybeans. So Roundup Ready soybeans that are able to be sprayed over so that you can treat the weeds that come up in the soybean planting throughout the growing season. So you're planting the soybeans, you're getting a lot of bare ground between the soybean plants. Uh, you're getting an added bonus when you use the soybean site prep of nitrogen. The soybean root system fixes nitrogen in the soil, so it gives a boost to your planting. Of all the site prep methods, soybeans are the ones that do the best job of adding that additional nitrogen into the soil and really providing a clean seed bed for you to go ahead and seed into. So here's an example of what I mean when I talk about a clean seed bed. You can see all of that available dirt um, that when you overseed with just a broadcast seeder, those seeds are gonna make their way down to that dirt pretty easily. And they're gonna have good seed to soil content, especially if you're planting them in December and they're working their way through and into the soil horizon all the way through the winter, through snowfall and rainfall then they're about right where they need to be. They would be right where another, Mother Nature put them um, at that time of the year. And, and then they'll start germinating for you because they've had that freeze-thaw cycle. It's really a great plan to go ahead and add that nitrogen and have that bare ground. Here's a site that was planted um, into the soybeans. It was sprayed over multiple times, so there's not a lot of weed cover. However, the farmer could not get in and harvest those beans. So we just broadcast seeded right over the top of them. And this has been a very successful planting uh, for that. Uh, it's a Missouri Department of Conservation planting. They're very happy with that pollinator planting at this point. You can see all the bare ground here available on a soybean planting. And you can see where, um, as you broadcast, it just drops those seeds right on the top of the dirt and it finds its way down um, through the winter. This is 14 months after a planting using the gold plan on a landowner that we've worked with with our program. Um, in Ottertail County, Minnesota, Mark and his wife, Tanya, uh, did a great, pro a great program here. They put in the soybeans and this is what it looked like uh, a year later. It was a really great result on this site. And we went back and visited the site four more years. Um, this is year five of that site. Uh, still looks great. You can still tell it was prepped with soybeans. It just has so much more diversity and less grass than you would see on another type of planting. And then this one is uh, year three following the gold plan adjacent to agriculture. We get a lot of questions about planting a pollinator planting adjacent to agriculture. And as you can see, you can have a lot of success with that. You just need to use your best management practices with uh, herbicide use on the crops and make sure that you're being careful around your edges and, and you can still end up with some really great plantings right next to you know, commercial agriculture. And our silver plan, much like the gold plan, involves going in after a crop and planting. Now, this will be after corn, wheat, milo, um, any other crop other than soybeans. Uh, and it'd be the same philosophy. You know, you keep it weed free using your crops. Really watch out for herbicides. A lot of times you could not go in and broadcast over a cornfield. As you can see, the amount of stubble here, the amount of litter that's available. Uh, to stop your seeds from moving their way down. So a prescribed burn through that, uh, corn can burn <laughs> and corn stubble does burn. Uh, so a prescribed burn through that or um, a no-till drill to go ahead and plant your seed instead of broadcasting it would be what we, you'd use in a, in a silver plan approach. The bronze plan, though, this is a landowner in Indiana that we worked with. Um, obviously, as you can see, the slope beyond this site very sloping, not a site where we'd probably want to go ahead and put in uh, soybeans, just too much erosion potential. So this site was prepped using the bronze plan, which is herbicide use. And he also used prescribed fire to go ahead and clear the duff off and all the litter off after he, after he sprayed so that this, uh, as you can see, this seed bed looks ready to receive seed. And that's what we would want to see out of a bronze plan when it's really ready to go. And then the natural method is just involves multiple tillage passes. And when I say multiple tillage, what you're trying to do is stimulate the weed bed or the grass underneath to go ahead and germinate, and then you're tilling it again. And this sometimes process sometimes takes as many as two or three years. Uh, could take up to four if you've got invasive species or something like 
brome or fescue that's very, very hard to kill. And we've just found, it, it just takes a lot longer with this. You really have to be in it for the long haul because your goal on that site is to keep that site from allowing any grass or weed seed to germinate during the site prep period. And because the period is so long on this, because it takes so long to kill them out just using tillage, you know, a lot of people kind of lose their oomph after year two or three and maybe aren't in it for the long haul, but you really have to be in it for the long haul to use the natural method. And it provides good results in the end, but you really can't shortcut it and play it too early. So my takeaways, when I talk about the site prep part of it, at least 90% of the success of your project is gonna rely on your site prep. No matter which method you choose, you have to completely terminate the grasses and the weeds, root system and all. You can't just mow over them. You can't just disc them once or twice. You have to kill them. They have to be dead. Um, that is why we do not interseed projects. And that might be a question that might come later. Can you get a seed to just add to an existing field? We don't do that because the foundation has not been set yet correctly on that site, likely, because that's why you're adding other species to it, because it wasn't doing a great job already. So we really like to start from ground zero and set a great foundation with our site prep. And we always say when you're in doubt, treat the site for another growing season. Just do another treatment. Don't put that expensive pollinator seed in the ground with all your time and energy you've already spent. Do not throw good money after bad. Go ahead and treat that site for another growing season and plant it when it's ready to be planted. Do not plant before that. And so the rest of the presentation, I want to talk to you about our sp specific program, the Seed Legacy program, and then some other resources we have for you, whether you're a program participant or not. Our Seed Legacy program, which we've got linked to in the chat here, is a program that provides free seed for projects between two and 25 acres in, side, in size. If you are larger than 25 acres, we also can provide uh, reduced cost seed for your projects. We plant all of the projects in two seed mixtures, one specifically for our uh, declining honeybee populations and bumblebee populations, and the other more specific to monarch butterflies and then other native species as well. So we have two different pieces of planting that, that are going on, the honeybee mix and the monarch mix on both sites that are planted separately. We provide seed in 14 states. We just added Kentucky and Pennsylvania and have had quite an interest level from those states in this first year. So um, if you link, if we've got the link in there to you go to the Seed Legacy program, you can see how to apply and those types of things. Um, if you're a cooperator, we have this long time frame where you can fill out an interest form, receive a next steps guide, see what you're going to do next. Um, we go through a pre-approval process early in the year so that you have time to know that we have selected your project and then you have time to then prep that site for that one season. Now, of course, like I said, if you're using natural method, we could do a pre-approval, but you probably wouldn't be planting the next year. It would probably be two, maybe three years before you'd be planting. And that's fine too. We just wanna get you on the on the docket so that we can get your, um, get your project approved and get you moving forward with some site prep help. And as you can see, we, there's just a lot of different pieces to this as you move forward through our program. You're gonna get emails like these here, your seeds on its way, spring maintenance. Um, there's a really great first year management webinar. And as you can see, we have a link in the chat to that right now. So you can watch the first year management webinar on how to manage your site. Talks about how to seed it, talks about how to read seed tags and how to manage that first year mowing, which is a big issue. Um, so we provide that and follow up emails like these two that you see on this page. Uh, with videos, there's a link here that uh, video that Pete put together for key mowing considerations. So there's all kinds of links and resources that we try to provide for you as you become a member of our Seed Legacy program. And here's some of the results about our seed mixes in our Seed Legacy program. This was an independent research project done by USGS scientists in North Dakota looking at roadside habitat, pasture habitat, other grasslands. National Wildlife Refuge, Conservation Reserve Program, and then our engineered bee and butterfly next-gen seed mixtures. 
And the top slide talks about the native uh, native bee use of the flowers. And we have eight times more native bee use on the bee and butterfly habitat next gen sites than there were on the next closest, which was a CRP at the time. The honeybee flower visits, we had three times as many honeybee visits as the National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and then we had twice as many flowers actually on site as the next one, which was Conservation Reserve Program um, for the number of uh, the flower abundance on site. So we kind of hit it out of the park with our seed mixtures, which we know we have a really good product out there. Um, it's just site prep is key to really realizing the benefit of that entire incredible seed mix that we offer um, for our par program participants. And this is what we've been, our, our seed of legacy projects are supported all by donors. So it's all a donation based. We are a not-for-profit, it's all donation based. Our expansion happened early in January this year. And as you can see on this graph that we showed you, these are our interest forms that we've been receiving about applications for the program. And as you can see in January, we had quite the jump. Um, and I think that was because we went down to Kentucky and discussed our big kickoff of Kentucky. And then we did the same thing in Pennsylvania. A month later, talked about our Pennsylvania program starting up. So as of right now, I have 400, almost 400 projects sitting on my desk that are waiting for funding and waiting to hear back from us about potential funding. Um, and that, you know, that all comes from our donors. So I wanted to put this slide in here because one, I wanted to thank our donors because I know there's some on this uh, webinar tonight and thank you very much for your generous donations. It, it really makes it roll. If you wanna make more things happen for pollinators, uh, we have, like I said, several hundred projects sitting in the wings just waiting for funding and waiting to be approved um, for us to be able to, as we call, be a shovel-ready project ready to go. So if, you, uh, if you're with a firm that has a sustainability goal, if you're with a, um, a company that wants to donate and give, yeah, come see us. We're absolutely ready to go ahead and spend those dollars on great quality habitat projects. Some of the other resources that we do provide, uh, whether you're a member or not of the Seed Legacy Program, is the Pollinator Habitat Guide. Um, we've already put that link in there for you, so you should be able to access that. It's a 50 or so page document that really goes through uh, all of these things. Site prep, how we design our seed mixtures, what's important when you're designing a seed mixture, how we design them, how you do management, uh, there's a lot of information in that pollinator habitat guide and a lot of clickable links with with uh, supporting video that you can watch. And I think you'll get a lot from it. This is what we want to end up with, people. Um, if you do appropriate site prep and you get it going, this is what you're going to end up with. And we're really excited that you're here tonight to talk with us about site prep because it just shows me how much you care about that site being successful in the long run. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have here about site prep as we finish up tonight. Thank you.